the fact that bhakti is an end in itself so if you look at philosophy you know the the nature of atma is sat chit ananda the existence the consciousness and then the bliss aspect of it and the bliss is in samsara all the schools of thought uh, they all acknowledge that the bliss is not available to us and that is this is valid in our experience our own bliss is not available to us but in the, the in the tatvavada that bliss, availability of that bliss is itself bhakti without bhakti that the bliss cannot emerge out of us saguna means saying that brahman has you know you can say brahma is a creator so if you say somebody is a creator that becomes a characteristic you know attribute so when you say somebody is a, has an attribute that is a saguna right so in the advaita vedanta you cannot say brahman is a creator the creator brahman is always the saguna brahma which they, it is called as a ishvara but not so in the ramanuja tradition or the the dvaita traditions that is not so that the whenever the upanishad talks about the characteristics it is talking about the supreme brahman there is no dichotomy of uh, nirguna and saguna brahman I am Sunil Vasist. I am based in uh, Houston, Texas, and I run healthcare startup and uh, health coverage uh, uh, brokerage. And I, my background, I have uh, MS in electrical engineering and uh, MBA. And um, on the the philosophy side of it, I I've been teaching uh, the Hindu community here for the last uh, 16 years. I teach the Upanishad and the Gita. uh and every other sunday or every sunday uh once we transition to zoom and um i had a great fortune of learning from my grandfather the the initial uh you know the learning about the upanishads and the vedas uh when i was young and so i have uh, pursued it from my childhood uh and now uh, sharing what i know with the groups so let me start off um i'd like to start off with an invocation prayer uh you're welcome to join ओम व्याम वेद व्यासा नम ओम व्याम वेद व्यासा नम ओम व्याम वेद व्यासा नम ओम भारती रमणोख्य प्रणातर्गत श्रीलक्ष्मी नृसिंहाय नम श्री आनंदतीर्थभगत्चार्य गुरुभ्यो नम सो द टॉपिक टुडे इज तत्ववाद रियलिजम इन इंडियन फिलॉसफी Tatvavada is not a famous name uh, we all know tatvavada as the the dvaita school of thought tatvavada uh, was the self designation of what is popularly known as the dvaita school of thought the original uh, name dvaita was also adopted uh, way back in the 15th century um, as uh, another name but one se- one drawback of uh, dvaita using the dvaita name is usually in english it's translated as dualism and dualism uh, it is dvaita is not really dualism because dualism if you look at in the sankhya school of thought or in the western school of thought dualism is where the philosophy where there are two irreducible entities that are like equal and opposite like the yin and the yang that i show here and dvaita is not that in that sense dvaita is more of triism it's a relationship between uh ishvara paramatma and for a lack of better word god and prakriti nature and the jivas where paramatma is supreme and is is and controls the the uh, the other two entities so in that sense dvaita is not uh, dualism uh, it's more a tatvavada so that when we when we uh, hear the name dvaita that needs to be understood it's not really a translation a english translation of uh, dualism So now what I want to do is I want to start off with a very brief history of uh, the Dvaita school of thought and then we will do a deep dive on the circumstances the historical context which led to another school of thought uh, coming up and what are the reasons for that and then we'll go to what are the unique contributions that you will not probably see on the internet if you uh, search for Dvaita school of thought because I want to tell you what is uncommon and more unique about the Dvaita school of thought and then uh, we will conclude the talk so let's look at the brief history dvaita was founded uh, by shri madhvacharya 
uh, in the 13th century in the South Kendra area of what is now the, uh, the Karnataka state. Very early on, uh, he was a Bala Sanyasi, so he took sannyasa very early on under the tutelage of Achyuta Pragna. And the relationship between the, the student and the teacher was stormy in a very good way, in the sense that when he was taught the, uh, the more uh, the dominant Vedanta of his times, he would not accept those principles and would challenge his teacher in every step of the way. And that's how he developed this new school of thought, challenging every, uh, in every step of the way. And later on, much later on, he was able to convert, convince and convert his own guru uh, to his school of thought. He has written 37 scholarly works covering the Prasthanatraya literature, which is the, uh, the Upanishads, the Master Key in the Brahma Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita, as well as the other uh, literature which forms the Vedic corpus, uh, a part of which is also polemical literature uh, which uh, addresses the, the uh, competing schools. Bhakti Stotras were also very big in, in the Dvaita Vedanta. One of the great things of this tradition, and we will see that within the historical context, was the tradition of intellectuals that backed what uh, Madhva had uh, uh, produced in the Dvaita Vedanta. They, he had great dialecticians that were able to standardize and make it into a school of thought to reckon with. And S.M. Das Gupta, famous author of the uh, history of uh, Indian uh, philosophy in volume four, says, mentions that Jayatirtha and Vyasatirtha represents the highest dialectical skills in Indian thought, such as the intellectual depth of, of the lineage of Dvaita. And uh, the lineage has continued until now for 800 years, almost 800 years, as a single school of thought without any sub-schools or offshoots. For example, in the Advaita tradition, there were two offshoots, the Bhamati school and the Vivarana school on uh, the question of the, the status of Maya or Avidya, which they addressed in different ways. No such sub-schools were formed and till now it has remained as one single uh, lineage of schools. And the great dialecticians that provided the back, background work uh, to provide the standardiz uh, standardization for Dvaita, some names were uh, Jayatirtha, uh, much early on, Vyasatirtha, the Rajaguru in the Vijayanagara Empire, uh, and Vadiraja Tirtha and Raghavendra Tirtha, and many scores others that have provided a lot of groundwork uh, to make it a, a intellectual tradition, but of course, also a bhakti tradition as well. So this is the historical uh, background of the, of the school. So now let's go to the dissatisfaction at the time in the 13th century and before that, for that which needed a new school of thought uh, to be founded. The historical context, if you look at the, the Indian philosophy, there are many ways of classifying Indian philosophy. You can classify it as Astika, Nastika, Seshvara, Nirishvara, Vaidika, Avaidika. So if you look at Vaidika, Vaidika, it's those schools that acknowledge, say, the Vedic literature as the source of right knowledge are Vaidika schools. And we know the Shad Darshan, like Sankhya, Yoga, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, and the Mimamsa school fall under Vaidika. And Bauddha, Jaina, Charvaka, and all these other schools form under Avaidika uh, schools. Another interesting way of classifying the Indian uh, philosophy is realist, idealist, relativist schools. So if we, if we classify that way, all of the Vaidika schools have always been realist schools. That is, the Sankhya Yoga, Nyaya Vaisheshika, and the Mimamsa schools have always historically been realist schools. For example, uh, the Sankhya school has, is the oldest school of, Vedant, uh, of the Indian philosophy that has always been realist. And the idealism and relativism was always heterodox. Those were the Jainas with Syadvada, the Bauddhas with Shunyavada. They were seen as something outside of the Vedic system. But after the 8th century's founding of Advaita, there was some feeling among the intellectuals of the time, uh, some of the intellectuals of the time, that the heterodox thought has somehow found a backdoor entry into Vedanta, and there was a fight that was needed 
to go back to the original Vedanta, which was realism. Realism has always been the bedrock of Vedanta. So they wanted to restore Vedanta back to uh, realism. And the first such effort in the 10th century came from Sri Ramanujacharya, uh, who first stood up for uh, realism. And he, he propounded the Sri Vaishnava, the Vishishtadvaita school. But even though he did provide an alternative to the popular Advaita of the time, the intellectual depth that Advaita carried, Advaita had great intellectual tradition with Sri Harsha, Chitsuka, all the way down to uh, Advaita Siddhis, uh, Madhusudana Saraswati, that Vishishta Advaita was somehow not able to match the intellectual tradition that was required to take a uh, rival school on. And so there was still a space to have an intellectual tradition that could challenge you know, the tradition of intellectuals in the Advaita school. The other dissatisfaction at the time was the position of Paramatma. In the sense, in a sense, it was felt that the Vedanta of the time, the Advaita Vedanta, had somehow compromised the supremacy of Paramatma. The Nirguna Brahma was nothing really different, as Das Gupta says in his uh, history of uh, Indian philosophy, nothing different from the Shunya of the Bauddhas. And so a bhakti could not sprout from uh, such a concept. And the, the position of uh, Avidya was untenable in the sense that Shankara himself in his Bhashyas had left the position of Avidya. Uh, he did not speak about it much. And so it needed to be addressed and it needed to be uh, you know, addressed in a positive way for realist schools of thought. So that was another uh, dissatisfaction that needed to be set right. For a lack of better, better term, monotheism is, uh, you know, there was no monotheism uh, because the, the accelerated growth of Advaita Vedanta after the 8th century was because it could accommodate all the various traditions that was, uh, that was there at the time, and it still continues today. The Shaiva, the Vaishnava, Shakta, Ganapatya, Saura, all of these traditions were accommodated in the Panchayatana Puja, where all of these could consider their deity as the supreme god. And it was felt that it was not really in line with the Brahma Sutra way of having acknowledging the one Parabrahman. And usually the, the, the schools that were playing for the realists were Vaishnava schools. And there was this kind of dissatisfaction that was not addressed, that what the uh, Brahma Sutras was teaching was not addressed. And so that needed uh, to be addressed. And finally, the place for bhakti, uh, the, the, uh, the schools, the Advaita school of the time was too intellectual for bhakti to sprout. And, and, and the, the, the thinkers at that time felt that it was dry and that needed more of emotional uh, reason, emotional reason for people to worship. And they also felt that it was against the spirit of the Brahma Sutras and the Vedanta. So all of these needed to be set right. And this was the historical context in which these schools of thought, starting with uh, Vishishtadvaita, wanted to stand up and for realism and propound an alternative to Vedanta of the time. And in the next one, I want to go into specific instances to show what exactly all those general things that I was talking about in the previous slide. For example, when I said uh, the realism, so if you look at an instance, uh, this is the Brahma Sutra. This is the second sutra, the Brahma Sutra, Janmadya Syaitaha. So this is not exactly the reasoning that was given in the school, but this is something that I want to share to make it, uh, you know, uh, as an example to all of you to understand. The second sutra defines Brahman. The first sutra is, is talking about Brahman, Parabrahma, the Supreme. And the second sutra defines Brahman as Janmadya Syaitaha. And as the Bhashya says, Srishti Stiti Samhara Niyamana Jnana Agnana Bandha Mokshaha Yataha. That means the definition of God is he who is the creator, sustainer, destroyer, he who animates from within, gives knowledge, keeps us in Agnana, you know, keeps us in Samsara, give, giver of Moksha, these eight functionalities. And so it was felt that you cannot have a creator defined by a, a, his creation, which cannot be real. How can he be a Janmadata, 
if there is no real uh, universe that was created so that was a very big question for the the other vedantins uh, to be answered because brahman himself or itself was defined in terms of creator sustainer and destroyer of the world and so the world had to be real and also as the the gita would say uh, in the daivasura sampat vibhaga yoga krishna the ideologies that krishna mentions that should not be followed were asatyam apratishtam te jagadahur anishvara that means those who claim that there is no ishvara no, no paramatma or those who say that jagat is asatya that is not an ideology to be followed so these are the instances that the thinkers of the time thought was not addressed in the dominant vedanta of the time that needed an alternative school to address these things that is one example another example as i said for a lack of better word monotheism it's very clear in the in the purushottam yoga of, of uh, the bhagavad gita where krishna says that there is a relationship between three it's a triism no it's not dualism it's a triism where krishna says dvavimau purushau loke kshara kshara eva cha kshara sarvani bhutani kutastho kshara uchyate uttamah purushastu anya paramatmeti udakritah so he's saying there are three entities a 60 60000 foot level level of 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 looking at philosophy says philosophy indian philosophy is nothing but the relationship between three entities the paramatma the jeevas and the prakriti the aksharas are the jeevas the akshara is prakriti and paramatma krishna says is uttama uttama is is greater than the prakriti and the jeevas and this was the relationship that was so uh, so clearly spelt out in the gita that needed to be brought into the philosophy the philosophical uh, schools of the time and then krishna uh, goes on in the same chapter to say yasmat yasmat sharamatitah aksharadapi uttamah so he's saying that i am greater than as parmatma i am greater than the aksharas the jeevas and uttama than the akshara the prakriti so that is that is the relationship that needed to be propounded in the school of thought that needed an alternative so these are like clear examples of what drove the thinkers of the time to go in for a new school of thought that addressed these things that were not addressed in uh, the advaita vedanta the other thing of the time was also glorification of sanyasa one of the things with the bauddha was the bauddha bhikshus was were glorified and the same continued in the advaita tradition where the sanyasa the letting go giving up was very very much glorified and as an example i'll i'll show you the two flavors of interpretation original bhashyas where you can see this is the first mantra of the ishavasya upanishad ishavasya midam sarvam yat kincha jagatyam jagat tena tyaktena bunjitha magridha kasya sviddhanam this is the ishavasya upanishad first mantra and the snippet i have is what shankaracharya's original bhashya on this mantra and if you see what shankara says here is he saying that ishvara envelops this earth which has chara and achara chara jagat is chara and it is it is basically an illusion uh, ishvara envelops this world which is an illusion so and the upanishad saying tena tyaktena bunjitah and as uh, as he says here tena tyaktena tyagena ityartah that means you have to let go you have to let go of your uh, attachments to this world and then bunjita he interpret as bunjita palayeta that means you have to protect yourself from the world which is an illusion the world is an illusion give up this world so this was the flavor of the bhashya that was dominant at the time and it glorified sanyasa and what the and and i'm going to share the other snippet and this is the dvaita bhashya of uh, madhva and the flavor of the same mantra is quite different in this one where madhva here says ishasya avasya yogyam ishavasyam that means this jagat this world is avasya yogya that means it is inert without parmatma animating from within the whole of creation is inert is useless without parmatma animating therefore he is isha avasya and not isha vasya as as before it's the same sanskrit the interpretation and the bhashya is different and then so you need parmatma to animate from within and he says tena tyaktena tattena bunjitah so here instead of shankara 
saying protect yourself bhuj palane madhva takes it as bhuj bhoga which is the primary meaning of it as enjoy what god has given you without uh, you know seeking the wealth from others and the reason being what does who what does others own everything is owned by parmatma nobody owns anything so so you can see the two different flavors here one flavor where it is you know the world is an illusion you have to protect yourself from the world the other is supreme god is the the complete controller the master the isha in sanskrita is master the master owns everything nobody else does complete surrender the same mantra has two different flavors and and this is how the indian traditions were answering and and that the richness of our tradition with these competing schools of thought were based solely on the same text of the shrutis and the smritis but the interpretations were quite different one asking for complete surrender and the other of sanyasa so this was another thing that was addressed with with other schools of thought like you know vishishta dvaita and mainly with the dvaita school of thought so this i gave the historical context of how dvaita came uh, into being uh, in the context of the realist schools of thought that started with ramanuja now let us go to madhvas and tattvavadas unique contributions to philosophy not just indian philosophy but philosophy in general and this i have chosen those things that are some things that you are not going to find googling on the internet and and so i these are quite different and quite unique than what you can find otherwise yeah you can google and find the the common things but what i'm going to give you are unique contributions to philosophy the first one is the grand unification any philosopher in vedanta can cannot have a school of thought without showing that the idea as being propounded in the brahma sutra which is the master key in the gita which forms the smriti prasthana and in the upanishads which is the shruti prasthana so you have to show that idea being present in all the three to be reckoned as a school of thought to create a school of thought within vedanta so from advaita all the way down to all the schools this is the 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 way to propound a school of thought in the case of the tattvavada the it went a, a step ahead and it created the prasthana chatushtaya that means it was not only the grand unification across these three literature but across the whole of vedic corpus so and and there was no karma kanda gnana kanda differentiation there was no uh, inferior position for rituals rituals were as spiritual as gnana or those were things that were shown the unity was of ideas was shown across the vedic culture with the master key uh, key from uh, the brahma sutras the other contribution and i'm going to uh, share these specific examples in the other slides but i'm just giving you a general overview of the unique contributions the textual analysis that was brought about by the the tattvavada was quite vigorous and critical in the sense that it has to be partashuddhi first the different copies of various texts that were there across india had to be analyzed to see if there were interpolations were some uh, omissions and all of those things before that is picked up as a, a text for which an arthashuddhi then came the arthashuddhi what is the real meaning for that so that was a textual analysis that analysis was followed Uh, which was a very unique contribution of the tattvavada boldness of approach so it was not only following the tradition it was following the tradition until there was a reason to break the tradition so tattvavada provided that break in tradition where the reasoning said you need to break from the tradition and i'm going to provide you uh, instances of these things as well and you know tradition is should not be blind, blindly followed but can be broken if there are reasons to break it and then there was no gnana marga karma marga you know bhakti marga you know for the three all these different kinds of uh, proclivities for individuals it was one path and the one path integrated knowledge karma and bhakti it's a triad it was not individual gnana always provides the light it provides the direction karma's place is to purify and bhakti is basically the expression of our inner bliss whenever we say our nature is ananda 
that ananda to come out has to be bhakti and so there is a place for all the three in a triad you cannot solely have a, a jnana marga which is dry you cannot only have a headless karma marga and you cannot only have emotionalism of bhakti you need the for a path to be sadhana you need the triad of jnana showing the light karma purifying us through our sa- seva and then bhakti is nothing but the inner bliss that comes out so that was the sadhana triad that was pro- uh, propounded in tattvavada and finally in the epistem- epistemology sakshi was a very important uh, concept that was propounded which we could see later qu- quite later on decart uh, uh, talking about that in western philosophy and that that uh, that is the truth we have access to truth even in empirical reality that means the experience our experience is sacrosanct it is inviolable experience cannot be denied at any point we can never say that only after uh, in a paramarthika satya that the experience is valid and all you know in the in the vyavaharika satya exp- experience can be denied so experience once denied can always be questionable in any point of time so to save from this regression in finite regress it was uh, taken that the sakshi that is our our uh, our inner uh, faculty that knows truth is always operating whether with it is samsara or after samsara it is it, so experience is always sacrosanct and inviolable and i'll give you the the instances of those so let, let us uh, look at some examples and let's first of all talk about the grand unification uh, and the sutra in the brahma sutra that is the master key is tattu samanvayat in the brahma sutras it says you cannot take a dictionary and then look at the vedas and give a meaning to give a meaning the artha shuddhi has to be there and the artha shuddhi is that has to be there across the vedic literature that is what samanvaya is samanvaya is harmonizing the idea everywhere because there are apparent contradictions across the vedic literature and it needs to be harmonized and only then can you give the meaning of a text and that is the need for the harmonization across the smriti literature and the shruti literature and the brahma sutras as the master key and so like i said there was a grand unification the brahma sutras the in the tattvavada tradition the brahma sutras madhva had the bhashyas the anubhashya and in his big biggest work is the anuvyakhyana that uh, addressed the the uh, the competing schools of the time and also gave more details of uh, the brahma sutras in in his work and then like the other uh, uh, thinkers the he wrote the bhashyas for the 10th Upan- upanishads and two works on bhagavad gita the bhashya and the Tar- tatparya and like i said he is the only thinker in the indian history to do the prasthana chatushtaya the fourth kind and that is he showed that the idea is also there in the rigveda bhashya no thinker in the in the other schools of thought actually wrote bhashya on the uh, on the rigveda on the veda samhitas so he showed adhyatma meaning in the rigveda for 40 uh, so, uh, for 40 samhitas as a model for how to interpret the vedic samhitas the corpus of the vedic samhitas and showed that the same thing that is in the upanishad in the gita ke is also there in uh, in the rigveda bhashya and same thing he addressed the karma kanda jnana kanda dichotomy where in the previous schools of thought karma was treated as something inferior rituals are inferior so in his work karma nirnaya he said in line with the bhagavad gita where gita says brahma brahmarpanam brahma havihi brahmagnau brahmanahutam the ritual is also as spiritual as knowledge so he showed the unity of that as well as in the karma kanda in the in the in the rituals that uh, form part of the karma kanda in his work karma nirnaya this was not done by any other thinker before him same thing he showed that these ideas are also in the puranas the other schools of thought completely ignored puranas because it it was appearing quite contradictory and conflicting to the views uh, expressed in the upanishad he showed how the methods of the mimamsas can be used with uh, as uh, writing the bhagavata tatparya nirnaya as a model for how puranas need to be interpreted showing the same idea that is in the upanishad 
is also in the Puranas. As an example, the Bhagavata Purana. Not only that, it's the same thing in the Itihasa as well. In his big work, Mahabharata Tatpari Nirnaya, which also had the interpretation for Ramayana as part of it. So he showed the unity of thought in the whole of Vedic Arbus, which is the only thinker in Indian history to show that single idea exists not only in the Upanishads, in the Gita, but also in the Rigveda Samhitas, in the Karmakanda, in the Upuranas and the Hithiasas. All through, it is ev- all of the Vedic literature is talking about one thing. That's the master key. Now let us look at the critical analysis that I said that he followed about the, uh, the textual, the Patashuddhi followed by Arthashuddhi. This is taken from the Mahabharata Tatpani Nirnaya. This is uh, probably the earliest critical analysis of Mahabharata, 800 years ago. Uh, nobody had analyzed Mahabharata critically in the sense that Mahabharata texts had various versions of, across India at the time, like it is today. And he had a great library of works where Madhva had uh, collected various versions of Mahabharata and critically analyzed them to find out what the real Mahabharata work is. And he says in this, Kvachit Granthan Prakshipanti Kvachit Antaritanapi Kuryuhu Kvachitcha Vityasam Pramada Kvachit Anyatha. Even 800 years ago, what he's saying from his analysis of various versions of Mahabharata is saying, in some places I see that some of them have you know, omitted verses or words that is available in the others. In some, the scribe has written his own thing into it. There's an interpolation where he's not taken the Mahabharata version, but he has taken, you know, he has put his own thing into it. In some, the order of the verses has completely changed. And in some, he has given, uh, as he has omitted, the scribes have omitted what should be there uh, in the text. So this shows that the, what went into the textual analysis, the Patashuddhi, before even attempting to understand the meaning of Arthashuddhi, the meaning of the, the versions. So this is a very uh, critical analysis formed a, a big part of the intellectual tradition of the Tattvavada Vedanta. The boldness of con- uh, conviction. And we all know Tattvamasi from the Chandogya Upanishad. When Shweta Ketu comes back, egoistic and uh, Uddalaka, his father, finds out that he has not had a real education. He wants to question and show what his position is. And the dominant padapata that has come down in tradition is tattvamasi. And that's what we can find uh, everywhere, tattvamasi. And I'll just read the first line here. Sa esho anima aitadatmya vidam sarvam tat satyam sa atma tattvamasi shveta keto iti. This is the line that Uddalaka repeats by giving nine examples, and at, uh, at the end of every example, he repeats Tattvamasi Shveta Keto, Tattvamasi Shveta Keto. And in all of the nine anal- uh, examples that Uddalaka gives, Tattvavada shows that none of this is telling Uddalaka that you are Paramatma. All of them are showing that you are nothing in front of the supremacy of Paramatma. If that is what each example is, how can he say Tattvamasi? So he boldly went against the Padapata tradition and he said, sa, it should be sa atma atattvamasi shveta keto. That is also another way of splitting. Instead of saying sa atma atattvamasi shveta keto, he said, no, no, no. In To be in line to, of the reasoning that the examples gave, it should really be sa atma atattvamasi shveta keto. Hey, shveta keto, why are you so egoistic? What did you achieve? Supreme is he. You are nothing in front of him. You are not God. You are not God. So that was a very bold step that Ramanaja did not go against, that Madhva thought that there was reasoning to go against that tradition, even though he also gave an interpretation of what, how it could be with Tat Tvam Asi. So this, this was another thing where there is conviction and when there is reasoning, there is no need to hold on to traditions because sometimes traditions are formed historically for no reason. So you can break tradition for a good reason. He showed that in Tattvavada. And the concept of Sakshi, and this is from a, a quote from Vishnu Tattva Nirnaya, how experience is inviolable. And this today forms 
the basis for scientific method. And here he says, Nacha Anubhava Virodhe Agamasya Pramanyam. That means if even if Agama, the Vedic literature, goes against our experience in our domain, then the Agama cannot be a Pramana. It cannot be a valid source of knowledge because experience always trumps Veda in this domain in which we can directly experience. And then what that meant is that experience is inviolable. And I'll, I want to give an example of what it is. We always experience illusion. The sun going from east to west that we see every day, it is an experience, but it is an illusion. But the scientific, uh, the, uh, the scientific me method does not deny the experience. The scientific method explains the experience. It explains that we experience sun going from east to west, not because the sun goes from east to west, but because the earth moves. And so there is an explanation that needs to be changed, not the experience that needs to be denied. Experience is never violated. Because if experience is violated in one, experience can never be uh, you know, revealing truth in others. Even if, after we get uh, Paramartika Mukti, what, what limits us into saying that, oh, maybe even this is an illusion, because that can also be denied. So one, one, if one in one place, experience, Sakshi can be denied, it can be denied in all other places, and knowledge will be impossible. So it is not experience that needs to be denied, it is the explanation that needs to be changed. That is a very fantastic uh, contribution of Tattvavada in the Vishnu Tattva Niranaya that uh, Dvaita propounded, that we have access to empirical truth even today that cannot be divided, uh, you know, that cannot be denied later on when, you know, if things change. So we can all rest assured that we have access to truth today as well. So these were the unique contributions that you will not see uh, in Googling the internet uh, that, that you can learn more about uh, the, the contributions from Dvaita. And the contributions were not only intellectual, but the contributions actually was also sociocultural. And I'll quickly go through uh, the sociocultural contributions. One of the biggest sociocultural contribution was the birth of Carnatic music and the poetry that went with it. The whole Haridasa movement, the Vyasakuta, the great grandfather of Carnatic music, Purandaradasa, Kanakadasa, they were all born out of this tradition. And they provided music, the whole different genre of music, the Carnatic music, to the culture. Then the, the tradition has been carried on till today. The Haridasa movement is available till today. The Vijaya Dasas, the Jagannath Dasas, and the whole Dasa tradition that uh, is still today. Not only that, art forms. The Madhva's direct Shishya Narhari Tirtha, who was, who was from Orissa and the Andhra region of Simhachala, he was the, he was the one who founded Bailata, which was the open air theater where dramas were done open air for people. Stories of Mahabharata, Ramayana were, you know, were uh, shown in these open air theater dramas for people to learn about it. Yakshagana is another dance form which is very famous in the South Kendra region of, of, of Karnataka, which where, through which you can actually express raudra rasa, anger, and, and, and awe can be expressed much better in the Yakshagana that was also propounded by Narahari Tirtha. Kuchupiti dance, which comes from Andhra, Narari Tirtha was the one that was also one of the founders of this dance form, uh, you know, in, in, in the Andhra region. What this milieu, uh, what was created by these traditions of realism was bhakti infused realism. These influenced later on to infuse the vigor within the Vijayanagara empire, the Marathas through Samarth Ramdas, and all the various uh, resistance to incursions which was happening at that time. And these, what was needed at, in India at that time was realism to fight with bhakti infusion. And that was provided by these schools of thought. And uh, the bhakti movement across the country had a lot of influence from Tattvavada, the influence on Beng Bengal Vaishnavism, the Jagannath Puri traditions, and then the B Maharashtra bhakti movement, all of them were greatly influenced by the Tattvavada tradition. So these are all the socio-cultural impact of Tattvavada and what it did 
across the whole country. So to conclude, what I want to reestablish in everybody's mind today is when you think of Bhakti movement, people always say that it's, it's an emotional thing. You know, people were, and more than that, it is an influence of the invaders that brought their thought that the Bhakti contributed to Bhakti movement. No, it was not, never that. Bhakti movement is, was actually a Bhagavata tradition. Bhakti is already there in Bhagavata. It was already modeled by the Pandavas in the, in the, in the Mahavarata. So that was the Bhakti movement. And it was not an emotional uh, movement, but it was a rigorously intellectual movement with a very intellectual tradition, which provided the conviction that could then sprout Bhakti. So Bhakti is love that comes from the conviction of intellectual knowledge not a blind emotionalism that was shown by these schools of thought. And, and the flavor of this is complete surrender to Paramatma and nothing else. Like I said, the influences that we see in the, on the Vijayanagara Empire, Vyasathirta being the Rajaguru of the, at the peak of Vijayanagara Empire under Krishna Devanaya, uh, Maratha empires. And one thing that the British did was the B British uh, took for idealism because they allowed idealistic thought uh, uh, that they could connect with Europe and they completely neglected the other tradition, the realistic tradition. And the intell intellectuals also uh, continued with the same way that the British showed the way is that Indian philosophy is idealism. And what happened is it seeped into our politics, which is all, but, you know, it is idealism. We have lost that pragmatic, real politic vigor that should have been in our politics had these realist schools had their field day and were exposed to the politics of the day, which never got a chance because our Indian intellectuals were more following the line of the British who had access to the text of idealism and wanted to connect with European idealism. And that was another uh, thing that happened that needs to be corrected. And finally, uh, these Bhakti traditions have deep influence on culture, the music, the Carnatic music, the drama, open air theaters, the poetry in the south and in the north, the bhakti movement in the north that were influenced. And the popular songs were always, uh, they were made to uh, reach to the masses, the, the heights of philosophy that was available in the intellectual tradition. Keeping that in the intellectual tradition in Sam Samskrita was not really useful. So they made these songs that brought these things in and provided the message to the masses, to, for the masses to understand. So with that, uh, I would end the talk and uh, open for questions. What was the origin of the Bhakti movement? And uh, what exactly, I mean, you get to hear a lot of uh, uh, theories that are uh, propounded, like it was there to uh, the, eradicate the caste system and the class system. And, you know, it was against the Hindu thing only to reform the Hindu thing. What exactly was it? I mean, I've heard uh, things of how under Muslim uh, repression and, you know, subjugation, the Hindus kind of lost uh, trust in the divine and they were too sad. So these bhakti movements sprung up in order to uh, make them feel better. So what is the origin? What is the story of this Bhakti movement? Yeah, so like I said, Bhakti movement, you can trace it back to the Puranas. Bhagavata Purana is, is full of Bhakti. Um, if you look at, look at Mahabharata, Pandavas were models of Bhakti. So it is, the Bhakti has always been tradition. And if you, even if you look at the Upanishads, the Upanishad says Bhakti is an end in itself. So Bhakti doesn't need a reason. Bhakti, because it's the bhakti that brings our innate bliss, the, our satchit ananda, the ananda part that comes out. It comes out through bhakti and no other means. So bhakti has always been part of Indian traditions. And uh, what the realist schools revived was that going back to the Bhagavata schools of Vaishnavism, which already had bhakti as part. And so saying that bhakti movement was an influence of Islamic cultures that was coming in is a grave injustice to the, uh, the, the, uh, the organic origin of this through our own texts, which is there for all to see. Uh, no, I actually meant that this coming out on the roads and singing and the bhakti was always yes. there in homes and mandirs, but this sudden coming out, it was like an act of defiance, you know? So that's what I meant, actually. 
yeah so that was uh, the haridasa movement so that is so that was even pre islamic if you see uh, the when uh, at the madhva time it was the time when you know you know the incursions were happening in the north and they were trying to come to the south and it was still not it had not still seeped inside so the bhakti movement was started even before that that coming on the streets and 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 uh, you know singing the songs on the street was their pre islamic incursions and but it came quite handy when it happened because it could connect to the masses quite well through these songs they did not go to needed uh, to go have an education a uh, rigor of intellectual education to understand the concept a, a, a look at purandar dasa's poetry shows those concepts already there in native languages uh, that was already there as part of the songs that ma- the masses could understand so going to the streets was already there as part of the harizasa movement firstly a uh, bhakti uh, you can correct me if i'm wrong is uh, devotion so that was always existent so what made it uh into a term for codification only in this sampradaya it is always there one Correct. two yes two uh the differences in advaita vishishta advaita and dvaita in the classification and terminology of atma paramatma brahman parabrahman ishvara these uh, if you can just give a comparative analysis so it one distinguishes between the advaita equivalent of that term the vishishta advaita equivalent of that term the dvaita or tattvavada uh, definition of that term okay so let me address your first question yes bhakti was always there uh, that's what i mentioned it was the bhagavata tradition it's all in in all the puranas it is in the itihasas what was different here is the fact that bhakti is an end in itself so if you look at philosophy you know the the nature of atma is sat chit ananda the existence the consciousness and then the bliss aspect of it and the bliss is in samsara all the schools of thought uh, they all acknowledge that the bliss is not available to us and that is this is valid in our experience our own bliss is not available to us but in the, the in the tattvavada that bliss, availability of that bliss is itself bhakti without bhakti that the bliss cannot emerge out of us so you need you cannot have for example uh, there are you know schools of self realization for example if you look at the other schools of thought sankhya yoga for example ishvara pranidana atva in the patanjali uh, sutra in the yoga school of thought ishvara you know when the 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 concentration that you develop the samadhi that you do the object can be paramatma but in vedanta the object has to be paramatma so the yoga did not acknowledge paramatma's necessity so you can have a self realization all to yourself without a need for paramatma being there as somebody that you connect to so in the vedanta schools of thought you do connect to paramatma and that is the way for your bliss to come out your bliss cannot come out just by intellectual understanding your bliss comes out when the intellectual understanding unlocks the bhakti so that the bliss can emerge out so that was a very important factor to say that the bhakti is not a reason to get something and then it ends the bhakti is an end in itself even after gnana there is a necessity of bhakti because that is the bhakti that gets the ananda that emerges out of you, uh, out of uh, you so that is the bhakti part and uh, and in the, the second one where you mentioned about uh, jivas ishvara and all of those these are common terms so they are all there uh, the advaita vedanta for example treats uh, parabrahma and ishvara as uh, different in the sense that the ishvara is treated as the saguna brahma that means the brahma with an attribute like you know omnipresent omnipotent and all of these attributes are only to brahma who is saguna but that he is also illusory in the sense that the real brahma is attributeless he is nirguna so that dichotomy does not exist in the other schools of thought in the other schools of thought paramatma is always supreme always omnipresent om- always omnipotent and there and there is no 
uh, space for an attributeless nirguna shunya kind of brahma uh, in the other realistic schools of thought but pretty much all of these terms are common because these are all based on the same set of uh, uh, texts the vedic texts and all of these terms come from those so these are not the terms that were invented by these schools of thought but these are already available and so that is how these they get this uh sunidhi my question was the brahman or the parabrahman is supposed to be nirguna in advaita correct in so i want a comparative analysis in in advaita and vishishta advaita that is nirguna so here it is saguna and correct. in in uh, in uh, ramanujacharya's view it is nirguna and saguna and uh, so the so the differences and the terminology does it mean something else because in many places many terms mean different things and so here can you correlate one term with one meaning in all the three in terms of ishvara paramatma atma brahman parabrahman so like the uh, nirguna saguna nirguna and saguna in the advaita vishesh advaita and dvaita so right. like that just rough, go across them quickly in the in the comparative state so it one gets a clear conception of all the three yeah so the saguna nirguna dichotomy i mean the sanskrit terms make it uh, you know little sophisticated but all that is saying is can brahman be expressed in positive terms or in the negative terms only so the buddhist had the concept of shunya where the ultimate end was shunya that cannot be positively expressed it is only negatively expressed but if you look at the upanishads upanishad says satyam gnanam anantam brahma so positively brahma is satya gnana ananta even though these terms meant a certain thing in the upanishad and the upanishad goes on taitri upanishad to define what satya means it's not just truth but satya means creation and all of those things so saguna means saying that brahman has you know you can say brahma is a creator so if you say somebody is a creator that becomes a characteristic you know attribute so when you say somebody is a, has an attribute that is a saguna right so in the advaita vedanta you cannot say brahman is a creator the creator brahman is always the saguna brahma which they, you know, it is called as a ishvara but not so in the ramanuja tradition or the the dvaita traditions that is not so that the whenever the upanishad talks about the characteristics it is talking about the supreme brahman there is no dichotomy of uh, nirguna and saguna brahman even though the term nirguna is used in the upanishad for brahman but the, the sense of that has been acknowledged to be that guna in in vedanta guna means the sattva rajas tamoguna that is prakriti that means the body that we have is guna it has the guna so when you say paramatma is nirguna that means he doesn't have any prakritika guna he doesn't have sattva rajas tamas and therefore you know brahman is also nirguna but not attributeless but without the uh, prakriti controlling parabrahma which is the fact both in vishishta advaita as well as dvaita but in advaita the nirguna is taken to mean attribute less which means you cannot positively say oh the supreme is the creator or the supreme is the uh, is the one that animates from within it has to be always a negative that is not acknowledged or accepted by vishishta advaita or the dvaita schools of thought you mentioned in the talk that the bhakti movement predates the islamic invasions so you touched on this a little bit uh, specifically i want to ask do you did, did the historical events at the time in india influence this movement so what what this the the philosophy was it what was needed at the time in india did the historical events influence the development of the philosophy the historical events did influence uh, like any historical uh, would influence the the movement but bhakti movement itself predates uh, whether it's the alvars of the tamil nadu that formed the backbone of vishishta dvaita or the haridasa movement that came from the dvaita these were pre islamic invasion pre influence of islamic uh, uh, invasions uh, in india but yes as the movement carried on 
as the societies changed, as the societies were going through a tough time, these came quite handy. And there was a lot of influence. And these were used as a tool to force social changes as was needed in the society at the time. But that influence uh, was like any other historical influence on any moment uh, at, at the time. And so nothing special could be talked about because the core of the bhakti philosophy was always codified way before these, in, uh, these invasions and these influences. Because you can trace them back in the Puranas, in the Bhagavata, in the Upanishads. See, Upanishad, Katha Upanishad says, Nayam Atma Pravachanena Labhya, Na Medhaya, Na Bahuna Prashrutena, Yame Vaisha Vrunate, Tena Labhya, Tasya Isha Vivrunate, Tanum Swam. Katha Upanishad, it says, Neither logic nor any, you know, if a lot of excellence in intellect, that is not what is going to give you Paramatma. Paramatma gives you, Paramatma chooses you. You don't choose Paramatma when you have reached a point of surrender. This is Katha Upanishad talking about surrender. So Bhakti is inbuilt in the Upanishads. You know, it is, it is made out that, you know, Upanishad is quite intellectual and Bhakti is not there. That is not the case at all. If you read Upanishad directly without going for the, in, you know, the English uh, uh, translations of those, you can see that bhakti is built in uh, in the Upanishad and the Vedas themselves. And so those were the influences, those were the kind of the fountains of influence of the later moments that came on, not just the Haridasa moment, but also the Alvars and the others and the, the Vaishnava in the Bengal Vaishnavism and all the Vaishnavism that came later on. These were all the triggers for that. There was always that codification that was already available in the tradition. So if there is one takeaway that I want all of you to have from this talk, that is bhakti is not foreign. Bhakti is comes from within us. Bhakti is always had been part of our tradition, is part of our tradition. It is not foreign at all. Thank you, Sunil ji. And I think uh, none of us is trying to imply the point that it's foreign. We're just saying that it sprung up with, uh, to connect with people in response to something that was not good around us. Right. But, well, I just wanted to get a quick uh, overlook of, you said, all these bhakti movements that have been happening since before the Islamic period. And so there have been different alwars, as you said. All these people, what was the reason for these bhakti movements to spring up time and again and go all about and preach devotion? What were the reasons then to for this bhakti, the alvars? What was the reason for them? So can you give a brief? Yeah, so the bhakti was already built into the Bhagavata tradition. So if you look at, say, Jayadeva, you know, Gita Govinda, that was pre-Madhva, that's pre, uh, you know, the, the Tattvavada. So that was a love literature, literature of love between Krishna and Radha, you know, was the Gita Govinda. So that sprung from the model that was set up in the Bhagavata, because it was story of Krishna and the story of Krishna is story of love. That was a model for all the others to follow. And so these Bhagavata traditions that emerged thousands of years from the Bhagavata uh, Purana itself, those were the ones that looked up as model. And all of the bhakti traditions, you know, usually goes back to these uh, the Vaishnava traditions, and of course, there's always bhakti in the Shaiva tradition as well. But in terms of the the bhakti movement, the dominance has always been these Vaishnava traditions that went back to Krishna bhakti. No, my my, first, my specific question is that uh, is there something they used to see in the society that they used to start doing this? But it was just random. Whenever you wanted, just go out and sing bhakti songs and come back. So, were there some particular cause? For this to go out, maybe the Indian society, some uh, reforms, whatever. There must be some reason that these uh, bhakti movements started time and again, time and again. No, there is no reason, actually speaking. There is a big, there was only following of the model. So this singing was there, you know, the the Rasa Leela. That that was a model. Okay, why do we have Rasa Leelas now? It's not, there's no reason to it because just that the model has already been set, and we are just following an unbroken tradition of this model. But it so happened that it, this was a handy tool to also influence society in a positive way. So when the society needed that, the bhakti movement and, and the poetry and all of that was used as a tool to enforce the change, but it was not driven by the change. It was all a part of the model that was already created in the Bhagavata traditions. 
just like you had the intellectual traditions of shankara like charya correct it yes. it kept on happening and kept on reforming and so it was always ongoing correct and the intellectual tradition has always been there and if you look at the intellectual tradition of the bauddhas they were the most rigorous you know the bauddhas were dharma kirti and all of these were the most rigorous nagarjuna they set the standard for how the intellectual tradition has to be and that the standard was followed by the other tradition because originally speaking if you look at vedanta it was the, the intellectual reasoning was really not required and that requirement came to take on bauddha schools and that why that's the reason why advaita developed a uh, intellectual rigor to take on bauddha schools and the and the and the uh, the, uh, the puro mimamsa schools and and then the other vedanta schools developed the same rigor to take advaita on so and and so that fostered these intellectual movements that makes india so rich because these these intellectual mo- movements have contributed to a lot of these dialectical ideas that makes us quite rich and so what i take away from this is that uh, they used to keep on happening it was ongoing and they so- sort of uh, uh, incorporated whatever reforms also needed so they yes. they kept it rolling to continue the society in a proper manner also so it was all encompassing Yes, and we always like Vedanta, the Hindu Dharma always had things within it to reform itself. You did not need an outside agency to reform, right? And so these were all the tools. Yeah. In the society itself, there were reformative uh, agencies yes. which we don't see now because the state has taken over. So Correct. we never looked to the state for everything. We had yes. our society reforming us at the base level always. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if you look at the Gita, yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati. So the society itself throws up these intellectuals that have the tools and the power to change the society for the good. So that that the very shloka in the fourth adhyay of the Bhagavad Gita says that these reformations come from within, not from without. The various sampradayas and paramparas Sampra. and all—they were given enough uh, freedom to reform. But now we don't see that; it's become so stupid now. Yes, But we have we have outsourced everything uh, to the state. <laughs> uh my inquiry was a little further to what uh, nan kumar ji was also asking you have spoken about the uh, differentiation between dvaita and uh, advaita basically in terms of uh, first of all that they talk about nirgun and uh, there is on the other hand what uh, uh, that uh, about uh, jiva and uh, the prakriti and deva but this triumvirate uh, where it uh, reality is talked about even in advaita vedanta there is truth being and bliss uh, and as you rightly pointed out that bhakti basically is the basis of every sort of a uh, aspiring in any one uh, thinking about the supreme however it is um, conceived uh my question is still persisting on this thing that a little more clearly if you could uh, point out that where exactly is the uh, i mean divergence between the two because in advaita vedanta actually there is no god spoken of because it is nirgun but what is spoken of is not actually it is that space is not absent because what they talk about is manifestation of reality so basically it uh, the models of reality if i may put it uh, that way uh, is what is different but basically uh, dualism and uh, for want of a better word basically monism and uh, dualism as advaita is ultimately uh, dualist because that also follows the experience and uh, knowledge uh, being experience uh, and knowledge and uh, ultimate truth the model and so it is in breath also so where exactly is the difference well, the difference is uh, so going back to the commonality first all of these three and all the others like the dvaita dvaita shuddha dvaita and all of the other traditions the other minor traditions they all go back to the source books of the vedanta the brahma sutras the gita the upanishads and all of those things so all of these concepts and terms are all from that so nobody has invented their own terms so but the interpretation of these terms differ nirguna brahma in the advaita is quite different from nirguna brahma of the advaita as an example nirguna brahma of advaita is that which is attributeless that which cannot be talked about in the positive 
that is yato vacho nivartante apraapya manasa saha kenopanishad the mind cannot conceive you cannot talk about it there are no words that can talk about it that concept of nirguna is the advaita vedanta if you come to the tatvavada nirguna is that which is does not have gunas influence that means prakriti guna is not part of it it is always pure unblemished by the prakriti sattva rajo tamas guna so it is quite different in conception and yato nach vacho nivartante in the tatvavada is see if paramatma cannot be expressed in words then no sadhana is possible so the interpretation of that of as the brahma sutra says is you cannot completely capture the infinite in words but you can in some way communicate about that about the attributes and a very beautiful example that's given is when you talk about infinite and 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 because paramatma is experiential it's not that everybody has experience of paramatma so like if you look at the basis of communication the basis of communication is shared experience when i say the grape uh, you know tastes sweet you understand because you also have had the the experience of that sweetness but if you have not tasted a certain fruit and then i tell you this is how it tastes how do i communicate that is the problem of communication of vedanta and the vedanta says in that sense yato vacho nivartante words cannot com- communicate because the experience is on one side not on the other side so one when the experience is on the not on the other side how do you co- communicate so you use both negative and positive so if you look at all of the vedanta all of the vedanta is always in the positive and negative terms it will say it's like saying that you know the this this fruit is sweet like a grape but this is not a grape so you need to get an idea but you also need to get an idea not to associate which also forms the the basis of pratika upasana the idol worship that the pratika upasana is you know there is a place but this pratika is itself not paramatma or not god there is gods as a prana pratishta inside it so never ever think of the idol as god the god the paramatma is inside so it is it is saying that the communication is only possible with positive and negative together because it is yato vacho nivartante because the experience is not shared the way to communicate an unshared experience is to show that in terms of what the other person knows with a negation that it is not really that it is like that but not really that and so that is what the whole of the vedanta is like that whenever it says nirguna it is saying ah uh-huh, don't think of a good person paramatma is not like a good person he is good but it's a good in a much different way it's infinite good it's sat is is it's not uh, you know kalyana guna like what we know but what we know can give you an idea of what that could mean infinite beauty we don't know but we know what beauty is so that think of that but not exactly that so that is the whole language of vedanta is negation and positive together so that the communication of things that the word cannot conceive can happen right and so that uh, that is how uh, yes yeah so but uh, this again experience uh, you said at one point that slightly nihilistic and denial of experience is there in advaita but that also i find uh, it's not really accurate since it does not deny experience it talks about transcending experience when we are speaking in terms of the ultimate truth yeah. because this exact uh, example that you gave about being what exactly is uh, underlying being is because uh, being sugar is not enough you have to taste sugar for uh, getting so this is the foundation right. of the advaita also so i don't know whether you are aware or not there was this uh, experience um, exchange between tota puri the guru advaita guru of uh, shri ramakrishna and uh, the um, his uh, Uh, i mean because he was some not contentious but he kind of questioned his devotion towards the deity so are you saying that basically and now i'm coming to the question that only the mode of validation of experience is different because now you're talking about you know basically what is the underlying the philosophy of these two things yeah so is that what is different because again experience is the way uh, the basis of advaita also so experience can't be made uh, the point of dif- distinction between the two it is a point of dis- distinction and i'm i'm talking about the bhashya advaita right so what what i see in the bhashyas 
and again this is not you know i don't want to make this polemical because this is this is to to showcase what the tatvavada is but the experience is quite different in the advaita the, the in in the dvaita tradition and same with the the vishishta dvaita tradition experience is inviolable even in vyavaharika satya even though there is no duality of paramarthika and vyavaharika like in advaita or in buddhism the experience is so the the world that i experience cannot be denied because it is a part of experience it can be modified but not denied but in the in the paramarthika satya of the advaita it is quite denied because in the paramarthika uh, paramarthika satya there is only brahman and then the question of you know there is uh, uh, the second anything second other than brahman being there does not even exist so what i know today has to be denied to be you know the sublated and denied to get the new experience right and experience is always self valid there is no validation of experience swata pramanya that is what it's called so if you have to validate one experience then it is an infinite regress then that experience need another validation that will need another validation so experience can never have a second experience as a validation experience is self valid explanation can be, can differ like i gave the example of the sun going from east to west and but experience is inviolable so that was the position and that uh, that was what was maintained and that was what leads to jagat satya samsara satya for example i give one example of the experiences of sukha dukkha is true today it is true even when i get mukti there is no denial of the fact that i suffer so that an, that suffering cannot exist in advaita right because su- suffering was always a maya it was always avidya it not because brahman never has the sparsha of suffering so if no, brahman doesn't have suffering who has suffering right so all of these questions in, in if you look at the polemical literature you can see that back and forth of what happened these questions of the the position of avidya the position of experience the deniability of experience all of these goes back and forth and uh, and experience is a fantastic topic uh, and you can see you know very good thing is nyayamruta of uh, vyasathirtha and the rejoined and, and the uh, the competing uh, the advaita siddhi of uh, madhusudan saraswati you can see the concepts and 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 the logical uh, you know, criticisms from each other and the tradition to understand what each one is claiming but one thing to take away from the dvaita is experience is undeniable even today explanation can change experience cannot uh, an an ex- an observation explanation and seeking your uh, input regarding couple of things if you can um jeevatma atma parmatma love and uh, uh knowledge wisdom uh can my question is can we address all of this these things in terms of levels of consciousness um consciousness being jeevatma at the mind body uh consciousness and atma that transcends the mind body consciousness and parmatam parmatma is pretty much the brahman um, which whose uh, qualitative description or experience is ananda pure bliss without any context without any background because it transcends any uh, prakriti or any mind body worldly uh, relationships or uh, or attachments so in terms of uh, consciousness we can address all these issues all these questions all these topics i believe and like you said experience is the is the pramanika in certain ways and the experience is comes through the consciousness or the levels of consciousness that is the mind body consciousness being at the what we call the jivatma and consciousness uh, transcending the mind <coughs> is pretty much what we call it uh, nirguna the saguna consciousness is, is which is uh, explained or experienced 
through the through the uh, vehicle of the mind and the body and prakriti and then we say nirguna that which transcends the mind but the consciousness is there but that cannot that the mind cannot grasp it's in the realm not in the realm of mind but that goes beyond and as the journey towards higher consciousness unfolds uh, is it right to say from the dvaita sense it's forward looking into the infinite consciousness that the journey is pretty much infinite and it is not wise to say that you have reached the destination and it is unreachable or keep on practicing your sadhana of expanding the consciousness and the advaita tradition says you are already in that higher dimension of consciousness you are already in the right zone so be assured you are already there so you are one with the uh higher level of consciousness or the level of ishvara uh, and in the pretty much be in the dimension of the zone that already transcended the mind body consciousness the krishna has in in the gita uh, spoken of vyavahara vyavasaya atmika buddhi ekeha kuru nandana bahushaka hi anantascha buddhaya avyavasayana why is there multi- multiplicity of thoughts multiplicity of opinions opinions is always multiple but when something is backed by the reasoning that's what is vyavasa vyavasayatmika it has to be reasoned out whether it is the shruti reasoning or the experiential reasoning that means it that which is reasoned out is always one ekeha kurunandra is saying this the the reasoned out is always one the multiplicity of opinions you know people oh i feel this there is no there is no space for i feel in my opinion i think in vedanta that can be our opinion right and and this is something that people in you know, always say oh th- can this be that can it be a journey there no what does brahma sutra say we need to stick to what brahma sutra says right it is not we are not free to just think what we think that cannot be called vedanta it is cannot be it can be only called our school of thought which has no basis right so what it has to be based in our experiences and in the ved in and in the vedic literature and and that is a fundamental thing and with the vedic literature doesn't talk about a journey outside it's talk about a journey inside what is that the 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 ultimate destination it is you being you fully right now we are not us fully a sunil has to be sunil fully a praveen has to be praveen fully right so that has to be fully expressed that is moksha it is like a small cup a big vessel or an ocean they are all full but they are not the same but they are all full the same way we are all in our different ways need to be the fullness of what we are right that is the the goal of that the universal consciousness i mean there is no the, unless you talk about an equivalent uh, sanskrit term for that these are all you know terms that people use that i i don't really feel it's meaningful unless you give me a sanskrit name of what that is actually talking about so are you saying that if you are saying about you know we are journeying towards uh, you know parmatma even shankara doesn't say that advaita never says man becomes god jiva becomes parmatma that is not even advaita advaita says jiva realizes and once he realizes jiva will not be there because brahma was always there brahma is brahma jiva doesn't become brahma right that is there is a misnomer that you know jiva becomes brahma that is not the case even in advaita right there's no a becoming b a will never become b right and that's and we have to understand so there is no journey outside becoming something else the journey is within becoming the fullness of who we are because we the avidya has, has enveloped us and that needs to go right that is what all of the vedanta is is seeking to provide to us and that happens only when there is parmatma in front of us to who we can link through bhakti and and you, i think you also asked about love uh i think knowledge and wisdom so again for a lack of a better term uh it, it's an english translation of bhakti but if you look at samskrita bhakti is the emotion that we have for somebody that is greater than us sneha is an emotion that we have to somebody who is like 
near us, appear to us. Vatsalya is something that we have for people who are younger to us. So there are three different words and we say it's love. So that's a limitation of the English language. But bhakti means it's the love for somebody that is greater than us. There's an awe factor that is there as part of bhakti. There's no bhakti without awe. It's love with awe. That what, that's what bhakti is. And then unless that is something that induces the awe, there's no way we can get the bhakti. And wisdom and, and jnana, I mean, I, I, there is no uh, equivalence in the Vedanta terminology. Whenever Veda uh, the, talks about vidya or jnana, it is talking about the true, the real understanding of how the things are. Uh, when it becomes pakva bhakti, uh, the, the, when the knowledge is mature, that is what leads to bhakti being expressed. Yeah, Sunil, you talked about Sakshi and the importance of, of empirical evidence and experience. And you talk about how this is precursor to scientific method. So yes. can you explain a little bit about how you made this connection? And is this documented anywhere? It is documented. In the scientific method, uh, you know, it's always falsifiable, right? Science doesn't always say uh, it, it is true. But the, also the, the, the scientific method is that experience cannot be denied. The experience, the explanation has to change. And I give the example of the sun uh, rising and going across the sky from east to west. It's not an illusion. It's a wrong explanation, but not an illusion. So the scientific method is based on changing the explanation, right? It, uh, a pencil in the water appears bent, but that cannot be de uh, denied. It has to be explained with the bending of light and all of that. The experience doesn't change, but the explanation changes. And so that if you look at all of science, uh, physics especially, physics is built on this fact that do not deny the experience, but change the explanation. But that is also an unrelatable topic, uh, unrelated topic is, uh, that is how colonization uh, came about. You know, what makes colonization? What, what was the, uh, the violence of the British in India, it is the denying of experience. If whatever we felt was denied as, ah, you know, this is not something worth. So once our experience was denied, we became colonized. As long as we don't take it back, we cannot uncolonize. Uh, 